Welcome to the Cambridge Forum uh, to discuss this extremely interesting book, The Trouble with Diversity, with uh, the author Walter Ben Michaels. I'm Scott Brewer from the Harvard Law School. Words matter, says author Walter Ben Michaels. The way Americans talk about our multicultural, multilingual, multinational society directly influences the social practices, policies, and cultural landscape of the nation. Are we a melting pot? Are we a salad bowl? Is some other metaphor more appropriate to describe America today? In his provocative new book, The Trouble with Diversity, How We Learned to Love Identity and Ignore Inequality, Professor Michaels argues that our enthusiastic celebration of difference and diversity masks growing economic inequality for black Americans, women, and other marginalized groups. Does the idea of diversity stymie the search for genuine social justice? What role can identity politics play in fostering a more equal society? Walter Ben Michaels is a professor of English at the University of Illinois at Chicago, the author of Our America and The Shape of the Signifier. He has also contributed to the New York Times Magazine, the Boston Globe, and other publications. His new book, The Trouble with Diversity, serves as the basis for our discussion. Welcome to the Cambridge Forum, Walter Ben Michaels. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, thank you all for coming out. I want to thank the Cambridge Forum for having me. I want to thank Scott Brewer. Um, I look forward to hearing what he has to say in a bit. It, I've been doing a lot of traveling the last couple of weeks. I was just in Milwaukee the other night in Lexington, Kentucky, talking about this book and about the issues around it. But it's, I've been looking forward to coming here because in a certain way, it's here in Cambridge um, that I first conceived the idea for writing the book, not sort of the idea of the book, but the idea that it might be worth writing it. I've been invited to uh, give a lecture at Harvard, and it was to a program that had several hundred students in it, all of whom had been reading a scholarly book of mine called Our America. And I was going to talk about the issues that were raised by Our America. And it was a large group, to say two or three hundred. And I was very much struck during the course of the time I was speaking, but especially during the question period, by two things about the group. One was that it was, you could just see by looking at it, what we would call a diverse group. And that is, there were lots of different phenotypical, there were lots of phenotypical differences among the people in the room. There were people with lots of different skin colors, lots of different kinds of hair. Another thing was that it was a group that was very aware of its diversity, and was, in fact, extremely pleased by and proud of its diversity. There was nothing wrong with that. Um, it was certainly a, it looked different from what it lo would have looked at Harvard or any place else 30 years ago. And it was very happy about that. And there was a certain amount of congratulation and self-congratulation. But there's no, nothing wrong with congratulating yourself if you've actually done something good. One thing I was struck by, and here's why I was struck by it, I had just moved from my old university, Johns Hopkins University, to the University of Illinois at Chicago, and I had been struck as I moved from one of those places to the other by the way in which my new university, UIC, was very different from my old one in at least one crucial respect. The students who went to UIC were a lot poorer than the students who went to Johns Hopkins. And one of the things I was struck by at the Harvard event was that while these kids were very proud of and committed to their diversity, they were completely oblivious to the fact that there was one crucial way in which they were as undiverse a sampling as you could get of the American population outside of a Republican fundraiser. And, <laughs> and that was, of course, what? Their wealth. They were a very wealthy group. And it's not just because they were at Harvard. If you followed trends in higher education at all, you know that one of the crucial trends in higher education has been a gradual I don't know what the word should be, enriching, enriching of, the, uh, of the people who actually go to the so-called elite colleges and universities in the US. And when I pointed this fact out to them, that there was a certain way in which they were not at all diverse, they were not very impressed by my pointing it out. And it was that, their indifference to this fact, that seemed to me crucial. Why did it seem to me crucial? It seemed to me crucial because it suggested that while they had deep commitments to fairness and social justice, they felt those commitments were being made by a system which made sure that no student got into Harvard because of his race or color. That 
Harvard was a diverse institution and committed to diversity, and that above all, let's say, the rich white kids didn't get into school here at Harvard because they were white. They were not interested in the fact that they did get into school here at Harvard because they were rich. And it's that difference, the difference between your racial identity, or if you read the book, you will see various other kinds of identity I'm interested in, and what we might call your economic identity, except that it isn't an identity at all. It's a, it's a matter of, of money, wealth, and income. It's that difference between wealth on the one side and identity on the other that I'm interested in. And of course, what I mean by the trouble with diversity is that our commitment to diversity and our commitment to the celebration of difference and the cultivation of difference has in important ways blinded us to the increasing inequality in American life. Here's another way to put the origin of this book less anecdotally. Over the last 30 years, there have been two developments that have gone hand in hand. One is we have become an increasingly effectively anti-racist society. And that's, of course, a good thing. I don't mean to say that there is no racism in American society today. There certainly is. But there's much less racism now than there was 50 years ago, and much, much less than there was, say, 100 years ago. Nowadays, if you make a racist remark, you spend, as George Allen knows, the rest of your campaign apologizing for it. I'm a historian of American literature, and I know, and probably all you know too, if you made a racist remark 100 years ago when you were running for office, you made it again, and you made it again and again and again. They didn't have podcasts, but if they had had podcasts, you would have been glad to have it shown over and over again, because that's how you got elected. So we are today an officially anti-racist society. We are also today a society that has had success in cultivating diversity. We are a society where if you go look on the websites of our universities, you can find within three clicks the diversity figures of the student body at those universities. You can click for hours and you will never find the income of the students who go to those universities or the income of their families. So on the one hand, we've had this tremendous commitment to and a certain amount of success in promoting an anti-racist agenda, of which of course I completely approve, and promoting a cultivating diversity agenda. But during the exact same period, the last 30 years, we've had another set of social developments, and that is the US, which was never among the most economically equal societies in the world, 30 years ago, we were way behind, let's say, the Scandinavian countries, has in fact become much less equal than it was then. If you look at a thing called the Gini coefficient, which is one standard measure the economists have of economic inequality within a nation, you will see that we have risen by leaps and bounds. And we are long since past France and past Germany. And we have actually, I think, caught up right now with China. And if we just work a little harder, we'll soon be as unequal as Mexico. So these two things have taken place at the same time. The question is, what's the relation between them? The central argument of my book is that one of the major, one of the major culprits in allowing this system of series of events to take place has been American liberalism. Why? Because American liberalism has increasingly focused itself, I would say not just increasingly, but in some senses ex uh, obsessively, focused itself on problems of diversity and discrimination, while neglecting, with remarkable success, problems of inequality. That is, we love the problem of racism, and we love the problem of racism because solving the problem of racism just requires us to be better people. And if we're here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or for that matter, in any university I go to, we always are the better people, and it requires us to be better people to get other people to be better people, to be, i.e., more just like us. We like the problem of racism. We like trying to solve the problem of racism. And we like it a lot better than trying to solve the problem of economic inequality. And it's not hard to see why we like it better, because, of course, solving the problem of economic inequality involves more than just getting rid of our racism. Inequality, actually, economically, has nothing whatsoever to do 
with our attitudes. It has nothing whatsoever to do with whether we are appropriately moral people. The problem of inequality cannot be solved by us getting rid of the way we feel about poor people. What poor people want from us is not what different races want from us. Different races want from us, whoever we are, our respect. Poor people do not want or need our respect. Poor people want and need our money. So the problem of economic inequality is a problem about the redistribution of income. Whereas the problem of racial equality today, the problem of gender equality, the problem of a series of essentially identity equalities is a problem about respect. And the argument of the trouble with diversity is that American liberalism today is much more interested in redistributing respect and making sure everybody gets the same amount than it is in redistributing income. Now I want to keep my remarks pretty brief at the start because the fun part of these events is getting to hear what people say. All right, of course, want to hear what, what uh, Scott Brewer has to say. So I'm just going to close by giving an obvious example. Obvious also because it's controversial. And that is the example of affirmative action. Affirmative action has been one of several litmus tests for American liberalism over the past 30 years. What's at stake in the debate over affirmative action? I would argue that in a certain sense, very little is at stake as to which side you take. What's at stake is you're thinking that the debate matters in the first place. Why doesn't the debate matter? We've had a certain amount of success in making affirmative action work. Our campuses have become known for their liberalism. Bastions of liberalism is the standard phrase because they've hung on to affirmative action in the face of pressures from conservatives. But what, in fact, has affirmative action accomplished? Affirmative action has given us the illusion that our universities are fairer places now than they were 30 years ago. But it is an illusion. What affirmative action has really done for us is make sure that the rich kids come in the appropriate colors. That's an advance of a kind. It's an advance if you think that you can justify your elitism by diversifying the elite. But the argument in my book is that you cannot justify your elitism by diversifying the elite. And my argument against affirmative action is not the conservative argument that we should worry about people's individual rights and that we should worry about the, the white kids who aren't getting in because an African-American kid who was given credit for an extra 10 SAT points or whatever. I'm not worried about the rich white kids who don't get in because some almost as rich African-American kid gets in. That's not a social problem in my view of any magnitude whatsoever. What I'm interested in is the, now let's say, 80% of the kids in this country who never even dream of going to a place like Harvard, or even for that matter, a place like my own university, UIC. They are not being kept out of Harvard by racism. They are not being kept out of, and they are not being led into Harvard by affirmative action. The fundamental inequality that presents us, that we're presented with today in universities, has nothing whatsoever to do with race or sex. Despite what? Is he still the president of Harvard? No, I can't remember where Larry Summers is in all this, but despite the injudicious things he's said, uh, both about some African-American intellectuals and about women in mathematics. Those aren't the problem that confront our universities today. It would be a very different world if our faculties, instead of getting up in arms when people started messing around with our affirmative action policies, were getting up in arms when people said foolish and inappropriate things about women's biological ability to do math, if our faculties instead got up in arms when it occurred to them that they were essentially turning themselves into finishing schools for the rich kids of the US. That's a social issue of real magnitude. The trouble with diversity is that it's played a fundamental part in enabling us to ignore that social issue. And that's the central argument of the book. You are joining us at the Cambridge Forum, uh, listening to Walter Ben Michaels uh, discuss his new book, The Trouble with Diversity. And I'm going to uh, open up with a question. 
that uh, I think I actually I have two general lines of question, but I think some of them may come out in the audience. One is whether uh, the shift to the focus on uh, income inequality uh, necessarily excludes simultaneously a focus on wealth, uh, on, on race and gender and other kinds of uh, disparity. I mean, do, does it have to be either or? Um, you, you seem to really focus on income inequality, but couldn't one address both of those? That's one line of question. But here's a separate line of question. And it has to do with uh, an idea of meritocracy uh, and where you, how you understand yourself vis-a-vis -vis the idea of egalitarianism. Part of what I understand you to be arguing is that because of income inequality in elite institutions and throughout the society, uh, we don't have an actual meritocracy because, you know, essentially it's wealthy people or well-to-do people are sort of buying their way into the upper echelons of these institutions. And part of that argument could be that we would make an improvement in, egalitarian, <coughs> in egalitarianism if we, um, you know, re redress that imbalance. But there's a line of argument that, and so the question is, uh, do you envision that if your proposals were adopted, we would move closer to a real meritocracy. I really want, I want to focus you on the idea of meritocracy. And I wonder how you would respond to a kind of skepticism about the idea of meritocracy that says that uh, the kinds of things that are uh, merit-making, the kinds of, you know, things like uh, drive and childhood experience and, you know, uh, 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 genetic endowment and things like that, those are not deserved by anybody. So the things that we usually regard as the things that produce merit uh, <clears throat> don't actually uh, succeed, according to this argument, don't, don't actually succeed in justifying uh, distribution on the basis of merit. I wonder whether, how, how you would respond to that kind of skepticism, the idea that it's too random, that the endowments you know, that, say, a poor person might have, you know, industriousness and you know, a certain kind of uh, childhood experience and family experience, uh, those are not deserved. So uh, do we have to give up the idea of meritocracy, or do you see your proposal as leading us to a greater meritocracy? So we'll start, I mean, there are two questions there, and one is, can't we do both? And I haven't spoken to a single person in the last two years who hasn't said, why can't we do both? So I assume that will come from the audience. Let's focus on the meritocracy question. You know, um, part of the, one of the sort of motivating factors for this book was I wanted to take, as the kind of bottom line of the argument, a position that I think virtually everybody in America claims to hold and that is the commitment to equality of opportunity. Now, it's well known, if you think about social theory, that equality of opportunity, what's often described as the weakest form of equality. Um, lots of systems are interested in producing equality of outcome rather than opportunity. But I want to just take, for the sake of this argument, equality of opportunity. Now, it's perfectly true, um, as Scott Brewer says, that lots of things you just can't produce, can't produce any equality at all. If you take the old Lyndon Baines Johnson metaphor of starting people at the same starting line, it's absolutely true that some people are born with greater ability to run fast than others. Um, when you were being told that you could go jogging with me with your podcast, um, you'd have to slow up to wait for me and the podcast to catch up to you. Guys, I don't run all that fast, okay? But, and it's perfectly true that under any system, you cannot produce a world in which everybody's gonna finish the 100-yard dash at the same time. Doesn't it ever follow from that, that therefore one should say, well, yeah, what does it matter if they all start at the same place? I mean, some people are just faster than others. If these guys start at the 30-yard mark and these guys start at the 10-yard mark, yeah, we can try and make it more equal by putting them all back there at the beginning, but they're going to finish differently anyhow because they've got different kinds of abilities. Well, part of that's true. They are going to finish differently because they've got different kinds of abilities. But part of that seems to me obviously not true. It's obviously not true that just because there are certain kinds of equality, inequalities we cannot eliminate, that we should give up on the idea of eliminating any inequalities at all. On the contrary, and, and this is a kind of political argument, I mean, if you do do polls of the American population, there's almost no one who says, when asked the question, do you think equality of opportunity is important for a fair society? There's almost no one who says no. It's hard <laughs> to think of good arguments for saying no. You can think, well, we can't achieve it, but it's hard to think of good arguments for saying no. So what I'm saying is, 
Not that we can achieve a pure meritocracy, and not even at the end. You know, perhaps once we'd gotten as far as we could with meritocracy, we might then have a different debate. And that debate would be, is meritocracy enough? And that's a real debate. It's not a debate that's gotten out of my book. The point of my book is to say, insofar as our social arrangements are justified, as we justify them to the people who benefit from them, and we justify them to the people who don't benefit from them, by saying, you had a chance. If you did not succeed, it is in some important sense your responsibility that you did not succeed. It's something about you. Insofar as that serves as an important tool of justification for us, and I think it serves as a very important tool of justification for us, our society has to make some kind of effort to produce the equality of opportunity that now we pay lip service to, but absolutely, completely ignore. I mean, when was the last time an election was won or lost because the Republicans were saying, look, we get that there's a lot of inequality, but it's okay. Inequality is either inevitable or a good thing. And the Democrats were saying, no, what we are running on is the idea of equality. That's the fundamental thing for us. We're not running on Iraq. You know, I don't know, is there anybody left besides Rumsfeld and those guys who think that Iraq was a good idea? You don't get to be, but, but, but if we pulled out of Iraq tomorrow, and if we somehow made Iraq all better, whatever that would mean, it would not make America a more equal society. That's an issue that, as important as it is, has nothing whatsoever to do with the fundamental questions about liberalism in the US. Um, whether George Allen is or is not a closet racist, that has an issue to do with whether you want to hang out with George Allen. But it's also got very little to do with the fundamental, to do with the fundamental problems of American society today. So yeah, I, I want to argue that basically the, the point of the book and the point of my argument is not that we can create an absolute meritocracy, um, and not even necessarily that an absolute meritocracy would be desirable, but that insofar as we base a kind of national ethos on the importance of fairness, and the idea that there is a strong link between justice and fairness, and that what it means to be fair is to give everybody as equal an opportunity as we can, we owe it to ourselves and to everybody else actually to make some effort to do that. It's not surprising that conservatives don't make that effort. It's a little more surprising that liberals are so indifferent to making that effort. Thank you. So how do we do this? Okay, uh, just a reminder that you are joining the Cambridge Forum as we continue our discussion of Walter Ben Michaels and his book, The Trouble with Diversity. And I think it's time for us to take some questions from the audience. And please remember to line up at the microphone. That's how we will uh, recognize people. And uh, you can just sort of form a queue. And... You just go ahead. <laughs> All right, I'd like to ask you about a uh, keyword that I've been hearing about need blind admissions. Uh, this is something that I know a lot of universities are at least considering or have implemented. And in particular, I want to ask if you think it's too late by the time university admissions come around, even if need blind admissions were put in place everywhere, uh, would it be the case that the fact that we in many families have uh, you know, two parents both working full-time jobs or more, uh, that they're simply uh, for many families isn't the opportunity to put in place the uh, skills for their children that would get them into the best schools even if those schools were need blind in their admissions? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm give me sort of give you two answers. Um, first of all, I do think it would be too late. Um, I think that the question of a university admissions policy is, although it's one that often comes up, is almost irrelevant to this debate because the tracking that our society does has taken place long before anybody figures out whether their SAT scores are high enough to qualify them for admission to an elite university. But second of all, insofar as we are putting into place things like need-blind um, admissions policies and even more powerfully um, need-blind or so-called merit-based scholarships, I think those are fundamentally conservative. It's easy to see why. I actually have a few pages about this in the book. When you have, have merit-based scholarships, have nothing to do with people's need, who, they're based on tests the kids take or grades they get in the 11th and 12th grade. Well, who, who gets good grades in 11th or 12th grade? If you want to look at it, SAT scores do two things. 
SAT scores predict really well how you will do in your first year of college for reasons that have never been clear to me. They just completely lose it after the first year of college. But they do predict that pretty well. What's the other thing they most closely correlate with? Family income. Yeah. Well, actually, a mixture of family income and wealth. So you want to say, fine, the kids who are, when you start putting in merit-based scholars, what are you, scholarships, what are you essentially doing? You're taking kids who already come from families that could take out the loans, at least, to pay for those college tuitions. And the kids who can't get the merit-based ones are the, precisely the kids who need them. Merit-based scholarships sound like a good thing. Need blind admission sounds like a good thing. But it's not a good thing at all. What, it's actually the opposite, in my view, of a good thing. What you want to do now is start saying, no, one of our primary criteria for admission should be need. You know, th this is why the, there's a kind of economic affirmative action. One of the things that people talk about with race-based affirmative action is, well, couldn't you make it better by sort of putting in a little economic stuff as well? But, you know, think about, think about, think about what a Harvard freshman class would look like if it were not only racially proportionate, but economically proportionate. The median household income in the US today is somewhere between 46 and $47,000. Half the class at Harvard would have to come from families earning under $47,000. That would be a very different university. And it'd be a different university in a lot of ways, because you want to say, first of all, most of the kids who were there now wouldn't be there. Second of all, how could these kids do the work? Well, of course, they couldn't do the work. Why? Because they've come from educational systems which have not equipped them to do it. Harvard, I don't mean to single out Harvard here, because Harvard in many ways is an enlightened institution, but it's always striking because of its great wealth. Harvard is dealing with some of the problems of kids paying tuition by, first of all, generously offering to pay the tuition of everybody making under 60000 That's a good thing. They've also talked about putting into place a plan for what they call middle-income students. Do you know what middle-income students means at Harvard? Yeah, you, you, you sort of do know, I can tell by the laughter. It means between $110,000 and $160,000 a year in income. That means if you go to Harvard, if you go to Harvard, if you go to Harvard and that plan's put into place, some of that 30.2 billion tax-free, you know, endowment is going to help pay the tuition of kids who come from families who make in the mid hundred thousands a year. That is what used to be called welfare for the rich. And our best intentioned efforts to make universities like Harvard more affordable are nothing but welfare for the rich. And that's where need blind admissions goes too, in my view. Okay, reemphasizing uh, class divisions within politics is probably a positive development, uh, but it's a little ambiguous from your book whether you'd place the emphasis on international class inequality or intranational class inequality. We have uh, a fair amount of what you might call relative poverty in the United States, but very little absolute poverty. You yourself say you make a quarter million a year and still don't feel rich. So there's probably no end to it among greedy Americans. But 40% of the world's population is in absolute poverty, living below $2 a day. And I think at least part of that is due to American imperialist economic policies, either through economic institutions or direct intervention. And the American working class has always been quite reactionary in a lot of support for these policies if they can share in some of the spoils. So the question obviously is, uh, are we going to sacrifice international class inequality uh, amelioration uh, in favor of emphasizing only intranational inequality uh, amelioration? Right. Yeah. yeah, a good question. First of all, here's a sentence I thought I would never be saying on television, uh, which is, no, I only make 175000 a year. I don't make a quarter of a million. Well, it's the family you're income. Yeah, you're right, thinking the family, family income. Okay. Whatever. Um, and that <laughs> matters to me. Matters to me not, of course, because I think that's not a large amount of money. Part of the point of the reason it comes up in the book is I, one of the things I, I argue in the book and try to show through a series of examples is that upper middle class Americans have a complete dissociation of sensibility. The you old know, T.S. Eliot phrase, I am a literature professor, after all, in relation to their wealth. So people characteristically describe themselves as being the very middle of the American economy and then say that their incomes are $135,000 a year, which does not put them in the very middle. 
And that does lead back to this question and this problem, which is that it's perfectly true that when you start thinking about equality um, and economic equality, if we look at it within the US, we have important differences, and those differences are getting greater. But if we look at it internationally, even many of the very poorest people in the US are much better off than people are elsewhere. And it's also perfectly true to say that my book is, in a certain sense, ambiguous with respect to this issue, which is to say I do not take a policy position with respect to it. And I'm not exactly going to take one now, but here's what I will say. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's a good question, and it's one that but it's obviously a hard question. Why is it a hard question? Because there's a certain sense in which the political unit within which we operate is still and shows signs of being for most of the foreseeable future the nation state. And the political unit in which somebody like me can plausibly argue for a commitment to economic equality remains the nation state. It's not, I mean, we have very little influence over what our government does, but insofar as we have any influence at all, it's mainly influence over what the American government does. So yeah, it's easy to say on the one hand, you want the American government to move away from its most imperialist uh, forms of foreign policy. Um, I don't think there are really almost any Democrats left who don't agree with that. Um, but the point for me has been, as you put it, internationally, to think about <clears throat> the inequality we have, and to recognize that setting aside the difficulty of producing sense of altruism or justice in relation to people who are very far away and with whom we do not share a political, a set of political commitments, we have a hard time producing an, a sense of the centrality of justice for people who live around the corner. You know, race has worked very powerfully in this way. I, I was given, given a lecture here a few years ago. Um, not the one that I described to you before. And I came out of a, um, of a cafe with a, a distinguished African-American professor, an old friend. Um, and there was a homeless guy sitting on the curb, a black homeless guy. And we came out, and my friend, I think, gave the guy a couple of bucks and said, you know, take care of yourself, brother. I was really struck by the brother. And I'm thinking, how come they get to be brothers? <laughs> My friend makes even more money than I do. This guy gets nothing. I gave the guy three bucks instead of the two just to say, hey, look, you, know, you don't have to be your brother to do this. But I don't think that made a big difference to him. But, and I think that's a huge mistake, obviously. And that's what the books are arguing against. But at the same time, there's a certain force in that, which is that the abstract commitment to justice is a powerful one. And that's an animating force for me. And that doesn't apply more to Americans than it does to peasants in Ecuador or than it does to people in China or anywhere else. But the political unit within you with which you work is also an important one. So the major thrust of my book, the polemic of my book, is directed primarily at the international. Yes, sir. I have two basic uh, questions. One, do you know about Berea College in Berea, Kentucky? Yeah, I was just in Lexington, Kentucky the other day talking about Berea College. Uh, I mean, that's a wonderful model of what can be done educationally. One of the premier liberal arts institutions in the country uh, has one, one uh, thing barring uh, admission. If you have money, you're not going to make it in. Right. I mean, it's, that's, like, it's like heaven in that regard. That's un-American. That's un-American. And I think that's the second question. We've had going on 40 years of blessing of greed in this country. And I don't know what else to call it. We, uh, I've called myself a socialist for 35 years. I increasingly get more discouraged with the direction this country is going. And I think it's, it's nascent fa fascism. Um, and I, I don't say that lightly. I say it with great concern. Well, um, here's the thing. I don't think, I don't think, I don't want to quarrel with you about how greedy we are. Um, I don't know exactly what would count as evidence, and I don't really know what I feel about that, or even that I have strong views about that. When I'm arguing, let's go back to the sort of need-blind admission thing, it's a good example. The people who put into place need-blind admissions do not do so out of greed. 
I just think it's a fantasy to think that they're these evil guys, like, you know, working over at the Harvard admissions thing, thinking, wow, this will really do it. You know, if we just put into place uh, this 110, 160,000 thing, we can completely destroy the lower classes um, and just make life way easier for that middle income group. I don't think they do that at all. I think they do it out of high motives. I'm always, and actually, I'm a little more mistrustful of the high motives than of the greed. Um, the problem is, and I think this is, again, the point of the argument that I'm trying to make, is that we have become genuinely committed to a vision of social justice, which actually has very little to do with social justice. And I think it's the sort of thing people can be, perhaps this is completely naive, um, but I think it's the sort of thing people can be argued out of. Uh, in other words, I think it's the sort of thing you can talk about with people and they can say, although I, I will confess, most of the people read my book even those who are sympathetic may not find themselves completely convinced, but the idea would be to say, well, maybe affirmative action is not the battle we should choose. Maybe class, maybe sort of, I'll give you one other example of the kind of problem. Walmart. We all know what the issues are with Walmart. Walmart pays its workers, well, there, it's controversial what they pay their hourly workers, but let's take their account of what they pay their hourly workers, which is the, the upside account, $10 an hour. Downside account is anywhere between $9 and nine sixty-five. But let's go with theirs, $10 an hour. That's obviously outrageous. You can't live on it. There's a, a big suit against Walmart right now, and the suit is a, a class action suit. And the suit argues, and it has overwhelmingly, in my view, convincing evidence, a lot of it's up on various websites, that women are systematically underpaid at Walmart. Now, we all hear that. We all think, that's wrong. Women should not be underpaid at Walmart. Women should be paid what the men are paid. Turns out, if you're a woman at Walmart, working full time, you make about $20,500 a year. You cannot live on $20,500 a year. If you're a man at Walmart, though, you make $21,600 a year. The women should make $21,600 just like the men. But if you think the fundamental problem with Walmart is that the women are making less than the men, you have missed something central. Now, the people who are following this class action suit are not evil, but they have missed something central. I'll give you the flip side version of it. Uh, as while I was working up the Walmart case, I was reading about another case, um, a, a suit brought against Morgan Stanley by a broker, a woman broker. A woman broker claimed, and again, persuasively, she won the case and uh, a settlement of something like $18 million, she claimed that um, she was systematically underpaid in relation to the male brokers, and that there was a culture at Morgan Stanley that produced this. And what she said was that, you know, you get in clients, and you spend the afternoon with them, and then sort of at the end of the day, or even after dinner, your male co-workers would, I believe I'm quoting this accurately, dump her in a cab while they took the client to a strip club. Now, look, is that a bad thing? Yeah, it's a bad thing. There's no question that it's a bad thing. Should it be stopped? It should be stopped. It was stopped. So what would this mean? This would mean that um, the broker in question was no longer making less than the men, which means that they were making 1.6 million a year, and she was making 1.2 million a year, and now she should be making 1.6 million a year. Another triumph for feminism. So if you think, if you divide the world up in such a way that what you want to say is, yeah, the women of Walmart, they're going to make 21,006 if this suit wins. And the women of Morgan Stanley, they're making 1.6 million. Good times for women. We're fighting for justice for women. You are, again, missing a fundamental point. Now, it's not as if when I tell those stories, we don't all get that it's wrong for the women to be treated differently. I'm not defending that. But I'm saying a vision of social justice in which you think that once the women are treated equally with the men, you have accomplished something is a completely mistaken vision of social justice in our social situation today. All this still counts, I think, as a response to your question because I don't think that any single person acting in this area, that is the people sort of following these suits, is evil. On the contrary, I think they do so with the best possible motives. But I think they really have a deep misunderstanding of our situation. And insofar as we come to share it, insofar as we come to applaud these victories for uh, equality and think of ourselves as a more just society, because now both the women of Walmart and the women of Morgan Stanley are paid just as much as the men, we are as deluded as the people who follow the suits.
Just a sec. Can, can I just uh, uh, remind people that if you'd like to ask a question, you can line up at the mic there? Um, <clears throat> I'm assuming you would think that the solution to all this lies in education for youngsters at, at the early ages. Well, that's I'm one solution. Fixing that and making it that you know, inner city education. Yeah, but there are other things too, like universal health care would be a good thing, like sort of guaranteed minimum income would be a good thing. Sure, but to, but to prepare people when they're applying to college and all that stuff, it's obviously has to start earlier. Um, and you're, you, I, I, you call yourself a man on the left, and you are very forthright, and, or uh, on the left, I guess. <laughs> uh, you, right you, wing you acknowledge blogs, that in the book. Right wing blogs call me a man on the left. <laughs> but you're liberal, liberal. Yeah, liberal. I'm a liberal. But, but you're very forthright in criticizing the left for ignoring this issue. Right. Are you willing to go further and criticize the teachers' unions, the public education monopoly, those, those institutions that are holding up education reform, public yeah, education reform? But you know, it depends, it depends what you're criticizing them for. I mean, when people talk about the uh, education monopoly right now, they tend to be, and I don't know if you do, but they tend to have in mind the idea that, no, actually, if we could just do more charter schools, et cetera, et cetera, and the teachers' unions are holding us back. Well, that's kind of open case. You know, there's not, a, it's not at all obvious. There's been a lot of work done on charter schools, a lot of new charter schools. It's not at all obvious that the charter schools are making much difference. So, in fact, the evidence, in some respects, has tended to go the other way. So if, if you mean, am I, do I think that teachers' unions are immune to criticism, I completely do not think they're immune to criticism. If you mean, though, that the central thing they're doing wrong is insisting on, you know, um, keeping public schools the way they are by resisting charter schools, I don't know that's even close to the central thing they're doing wrong. So I don't, I don't think that, I think that the whole school system is an important part of the problem. I don't think that it's within teachers' unions' abilities to begin to solve that problem, but you can suggest some ways. I mean, one thing you could do, for example, is right away eliminate uh, property taxes as the basis for public education. Nothing you could do is eliminate private education altogether. You know, that would make a big difference. That's a good way to pass on inequality. I've been passing on inequality to my children through private education ever since they were old enough to go to school. It's a rational thing to do in the society if you can afford it. It's not necessarily a good thing for the society. You know, part of the point of the book, this goes back to the 175,000 thing, is I'm not arguing that I'm a virtuous person. I'm arguing though there is a set of things which I would rather live in a society that was doing. And if someone took away from me the option to buy my children their privilege, uh, I wouldn't be able to do it. So yeah, there are a lot of things you could think about. Um, and again, I, you know, I hold no brief for teachers unions. Um, but on the other hand, I'm a little suspicious of the idea that teachers unions are the real problem. Hi, thank you for coming today. Um, thank you for having me. <laughs> I think that uh, your example about Morgan Stanley and Walmart sort of speaks of the way the legal system structures what we think about as social justice. So for instance, there is a cause for sex discrimination, but as far as I know, and Professor Brewer, you can correct me if I'm wrong, there is no cause for economic discrimination. So my question is, what would you do to reform the legal system? And second of all, do you think those reforms are feasible? Yeah, that, those are both good questions. Um, actually, you know, I think one of the marks of the impoverishment of liberalism in the US is that it's now so committed to reform through the legal system. I mean, here's a, the purest version of it. Until Democrats got really lucky in the past six weeks in the kind of perfect storm, which we're hoping, if we are Democrats, John Kerry hasn't screwed up. In, until that happened, the, you know, people's idea of being on the left was hoping and praying that Bush would screw up and appoint someone to the Supreme Court who really wasn't right wing. You know, you ever heard, you hear sentences over and over again like, well, you can't tell, they always turn out to be different from what you thought. The idea there being that what we should do is reform through the legal system. I actually think that's wrong. I don't, it, I think it's strategically wrong and I think it also makes no sense. The legal system, it's, the injustices that I'm interested in are precisely the ones you described. They are not injustices that our legal system is set up to rectify. In fact, the very notion of economic discrimination is something I sort of talk about in the book. We, there is no such thing as economic discrimination. There's a, a story, there's The Simpsons. Everybody seen The Simpsons? Not so high-minded that you've never seen The Simpsons, right? Simpsons have an episode that takes place. Part of it takes place in something which is called the Rich People's Mall. And it says, Something like, we, we're no longer allowed to discriminate, but our prices do it for us. <laughs> but what's the point of the joke? The point of the joke is not that, they need, that you need laws telling poor people they can't go shop at the rich people's mall. 
The poor people can't go shop at the rich people's mall because they haven't got enough money to shop there. The changes that are involved there, no legal reform, right, is going to make it possible for people who have no money to go and spend the money they don't have at a place that charges them those high prices. So my own sense would be, if you're interested in the kind of reforms that I'm talking about and the kind of reforms that seem to me basic, the law is actually not the first place to look. And that reforming the legal system is not the way to start. A strong union movement would be a better place to look. Actually, registering lots of poor people to vote would be a better place to look. Redoing education. I mean, there are some things. I mean, for example, here's a reform in the legal system. If you did what I want to do and made private schools illegal, that would be a problem. Because ever since the beginning of the 20th century, um, when a case was adjudicated along those lines, the Supreme Court has declared that you cannot eliminate private schools. So, okay, occasionally you have to plug, plug a few gaps and change a few laws. But I don't think the legal system is the place to start. Hi. Um, in addition to economic diversity in universities, um, how important is, is it for us to also strive for this in industry, in business, in politics, in government? Yeah, the thing is, I don't, I mean, I, I, I must have misspoke before. I'm not for economic diversity. In fact, the very idea, I think, is the problem. There's only one way you get economic diversity. <laughs> Economic diversity, here's a dictionary definition of economic diversity, inequality. That's what the economic diversity is. That's why I don't think of your place in the economy as a kind of identity. No one's going to celebrate the fact that, geez, you know, I mean, suppose you've got economic diversity at universities. Right now you've got, you know, let's go, I belong to the African American Students Club, I belong to the Gay and Lesbian Students Club, I can go live over at Latino House. Hey, like, I belong to Poor House. Yeah, we live over at Poor House. But you know, it's true that the electricity isn't working that well, but people respect our identity, you know? So they, we love what you can do with the place given the relative lack of light, is what they say. So what you want to say about that is, no, we're not really interested in economic diversity. And I don't think that is the, I mean, economic diversity is the problem. Um, and it's a kind of interesting fact. I'm a, I am a professor of literature. You know things are getting bad when, uh, but bad in a way is kind of gratifying to me because it's sort of like a, it's what you'd predict. When you get in the mail a new anthology, an American literature anthology. Now, there are a lot of American literature anthologies. And there's first American literature, then there's African American literature, there's literature by women. So all these anthologies. So I got an anthology sent to my desk the other day. It is the Anthology of American Working Class Literature. What does that mean? That's the anthology of literature by relatively poor people. Now, the point of the African-American one is you want to say, look, African-Americans produce great literature. There's no real inequality there. It's been a mistake. We've treated African-Americans as if they were unequal. But what this great literary tradition, which it is, helps us to see is that they're not unequal. So we get, we get the poor people's anthology. That shows up. We say, yes, look, you know, these poor people are actually kind of great. We've been wrong in disrespecting poor people. We should give poor people the credit they do. We should admire their culture. We should admire their literature, their taste in art, and like what they can do with those old cars. <laughs> but the minute you start thinking of poverty as a kind of identity, then the trouble with diversity has become very real. The trouble with diversity at that moment is that you cannot see the inequality when it's staring you in the face. It's there saying, I am inequality, and you're saying, come on in, diversity. So, yeah, for me, economic diversity is not the problem. I mean, it is the problem, not the solution. And it's the solution in all the, in, and the getting rid of it would be the solution in all the institutions you described. 